All right, I think we are live now. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, hello on Twitch. Um, uh, I'm excited to be streaming again this week, and I have two guests from the Native Image team. I have uh, Christian Wimmer, a Native Image lead here, and I have uh, Voyin, uh, who is uh, has uh, done also like uh, like this, this like like uh, done very like uh, great work on all parts of the native image stack and specifically in the area of uh, making uh, native image work for spring native uh, among other things and uh, we want to today uh like uh, discuss uh like uh, some of the design decisions around native image class associations some of the issues around that and um uh, what uh, what are the what are the potential problems you can face with glass initialization with native image and how to tame those problems. And uh, so Boyne has prepared a document uh, on GitHub uh, that will guide us through this uh, discussion. And uh, Boyne will uh, now share this document and start with uh, with uh, like uh, going through it and uh, we will uh, discuss the various aspects of it. Uh, let me now change to the setup with sharing the screen uh, of Wayne and uh, Wayne, please take it away. Cool. Thanks, Thomas. So, yeah, um, so I would like to start this presentation because uh, with, with essentially why are we doing build time initialization in the first place, right? So, so because in the community, I kind of feel that there is there is two mindsets and and uh, some people are um, are really eager on on build time initializations, where others are saying uh, don't don't do this. Really, it's not not necessary. And then in this in this whole presentation, I will kind of try to uh, try to uh, try to essentially present why why build time initialization is sometimes extremely good. And I will also also show to try to show the pitfalls of of build time initialization that that beat me and and people I work with personally. So so basically that that you know that, and, and this document that we leave here is supposed to guide people that want to decide whether they should initialize something with build time or not, how to do it essentially properly. Right? So so let's start with the why why build time initialization. Right. So so um, essentially um, in ahead of time compilers, which is a Gravian native image, it is not is it for every for by the semantics of Java for every field access or or field uh, or method access or type access, we have to check whether this type has been initialized already or not. Right. And in JIT compilers, this is not the problem because the interpreter will do this. And once we compile the code, this, all, all these checks are basically removed. So, so, so the interpreter, like the compiler, doesn't have to worry about this. And what this amounts to is, for example, if you have something like, like a constant math of pi here, um, when we actually look behind the scenes, it will, it will become something like uh, these are a bit of intrinsics, which you, which are kind of uh, assembly code, but I put them here. So if, so if, if you know, if this class is not initialized, then initialize it and then fetch a code. So, so essentially, for each, for for every single constant or like field write or or anything, we have to do such a check. And these checks uh, tend to be expensive, but they're they're in a in a tight loop. Right. So, so we can we can kind of uh, go to this example here, and basically and see see how this how this looks. Right. So, if we have this hot path check, so we, I, I made two classes here, which we will use this example throughout the talk. Um, and basically, it's a it's a very um, it's a, it, it just has two classes, which are like a, one is called slow math, and this slow math has this field here fast square root which basically fetches the square root from a system property which is in this hidden behind this um, place here and then it you know chooses whether it should use the, the square root from quake 2 or it will use a, a regular computation of a square root right and then it has another function which is a math math function like it can be anything right it's really here just for example it's just add right and this has nothing to do with our square root and then if you use this in a in a in a in a loop that does like many iterations of very some, something simple like summing all of the numbers, right? So if we do a slow math dot add, right, and we do a fast math dot add, the results will be quite different, right? So we can we can maybe even try this out, right? So if you so this this also shows how the the repository is organized, right? So what we leave here is a uh, so we have we are here in the repo, right? And so we can essentially first run this with in JIT mode and see. Um, yeah, so each of the examples right here it's because of the warm up but essentially when you warm it up it's it's exactly the same uh 
and then but then in in the in the in the native image mode we'll see that we'll be the native image of this class we will see that essentially there is like a 2x difference basically and this 2x difference uh will come just from this single check right so so essentially if you write high performance code uh you you really need to care about what happens with your class initialization right if you're if you're essentially using a if you're using a library that is used only a few times across your project something like config parsing and, and stuff like that you don't you don't have to really worry about this right so so let's um, let's look at the result. You're building an native image of this, and then we see that it's like you know the first the slow path took uh, yeah exactly twice as much twice as much as the as um, as the as the basically the fast one right. So let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so cool. Um, and then the second the second reason for build time initialization is essentially to uh to at the same time reduce uh the binary size and essentially have less less configuration for our native images so so um and we, we did this uh, good experiment with netty where essentially uh, netty is currently initialized in build time and that's mostly for historic reasons because at the when this was done netty you know we didn't support many parts of netty um we couldn't even configure um we couldn't even configure some of the some of the reflections, so it was impossible to run Netty without initialization and build time. And then we decided to put it back into like a regular mode, which is runtime initialization. And then what happened with Netty was a good experiment. We essentially made this PR where we say, okay, let's let's change the the initialization to be by default at build time. And what we what we ended up is really like tons of config. If you look at here, right, we, these files are even too big to be loaded, right? So essentially. Most of the changes look like this. We say now we don't initialize NetKit build time anymore, right? But then we ended up with humongous like diffs of essentially new configuration that we that we need to introduce right? for for NetKit to be correct. And and this is this was really annoying because it resulted in it resulted in essentially in a in a growth of image from about 16 to 20 megabytes in binary size. And uh, and essentially it was it was by like uh, it was basically uh, five five megabytes five megabytes uh, so four to five megabytes bigger and it was like I, I think a five x factor of configuration. So was, so wait so so really so for, like maybe maybe take a little bit of a step back and like so by default mm -hmm. when you do an application and you create any different image out of it, a class is initialized at runtime, right? Right, that's our default. Build that's the, that that's the default if you don't specify anything, right? Yes. But um, but then uh, like we have also some automatic detection to remove some of those checks if a class doesn't have a complex static initializer in. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, we, have, we have automatic checks, but but uh, uh, these checks work only for simple classes. We will come for right. that really soon. Mm -hmm. uh, we ha have this action very really soon. Uh, but if you look at Netty, for example, right mm -hmm. here. Uh, yes, so Netty is a complex case. It has very complex classes, right? So yes, exactly. Right. It has very so, complex static initializers. Right, right. It has extremely complex stuff, right? So if you look, for example, here, it does, this is a, even a simple one, but it says like, you know, resource link right. detector. And then when you, when you look at this add exclusions, right, you will see that this, this thingy goes with a loop through all declared right. methods and then basically looks for a certain method and then this this makes a complete mess right so, right. so if you initialize that class not at build time but at runtime then you will have to specify all these reflection configurations and that's what you referred to in the previous yes okay. yes yes or either be very smart at what you initialize so your agent won't be any more efficient than doing this so you have to maybe can't pick and this becomes extremely hard to maintain right mm -hmm. but, so so and that's that's the problem with with net okay so so then we have uh, um, and then the last the last the last reason to do um, class initialization is essentially uh, faster startup via heap snapshotting so when we initialize stuff at, at build time we will basically uh, we, we can store parts of the of the data in the image so it's loaded together with the binary and we don't have to compute this data anymore so we kind of move the computation to build time and then just reuse the data and for that 
uh, we have uh, we have two examples, which is which is one is from the from which is used for for if you want to, for example, parse some some parse some configuration while you're building an image, which could be a perfect case for, for example, serverless computing, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at this example, right? So if you look at this example, right? So here we will have a, a you know we we will a very simple example. We use Jackson. Uh, a Jackson library to essentially just read some JSON from uh, from uh, from a resource, right? And we will store this in a data structure, which is a co contains a list of a map of employee data, right? So a list of a map of a string and a string. And then if you say initialize at build time, so we have to explicitly say because this this will not be proven by our system, right? Because it goes out of scope. Right. Um, uh, it has side effects and so on, right? Later, when we read this employee data, this will be, we will save here, for example, in this example, we will save about 50, 50 milliseconds in, 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 in this operation, right? So it will make this operation very fast, mm -hmm. okay? And another, this is this is for the kind of user facing stuff. And also right, this, this is to cache things, right? Because whatever yeah. is stored in static fields of a class that is initialized at build time will end up in the image heap, right? Yes. Yes. And yes. that one is going to be there like immediately without any additional code being run uh, when you start your app because we just memory map that image heap when we start the application. Exactly, right? right. And then load it lazily as, as with the operating system. Right. So in some, sense, in some sense, we have here the ability to do snapshotting for Java application, like efficient heap snapshotting for Java application. Exactly, efficient heap snapshotting. And and for example, parsing configs is one of the great examples. Mm -hmm. And it's also for what well, another great example is this pre-initialization of context for GraalVM languages, right? Mm -hmm. So so here we what we use this for is like for example for JavaScript and Ruby. Um, and here we have the instru instructions count. So we will take a first context because each language has some some part of a startup code written in the language itself. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we execute this code at build time and then store it and then once we run the for example hello world it just runs here it runs two times faster and in ruby it's about uh, three and a half times faster basically mm -hmm. so 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 we save quite a bit and make our startup of our languages snappy right so mm -hmm. this is another cool example and and in this system space there is many other places where this is a super useful tool so right. right and and kind of doing this doing this without the, the snapshotting would require Mm -hmm. um, intense, intense work basically, and right. it would, it would, uh, you, would, you would need a lot of like over, like maintenance overhead. And here you basically just a, you know few, few classes and you're done. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's also uh, in a sense when you do system programming, it's a, it's, it's a time saver, really a, a big one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, one, one comment also, Thomas, you said of course that uh, static fields is more or less in, in a normal Java application the only way you can more or less do pre-initialization because it's like yeah you run a class initializer and it stores data in a static field and that static field is then automatically available but that's more or less just because java doesn't have a better api for that for native image we added our own api called image singletons for that okay. but uh, it, it's good enough for, for most use cases to uh, to use uh, static fields and do it more or less indirectly via that but if you really want to buy the very clean application, uh, mm -hmm. then you can also use our API for that. Right. Okay. There's a, like, so a native image API where I give it like an object and say, please make this available at. Uh... Exactly. It, it's like it's like a key value store. You say, well, under this key, I make an object available, and that's then, yeah, uh, an object that you explicitly more or less place into the image heap. Mm -hmm. But. Cool. Well, and, yeah, right. and this this image heap is it like does it have like a read only section and a write section or is it just one section that is writable? How do we? We have a read only section too, mm -hmm. uh, and but uh, and the static analysis also actually finds out if you have uh, a class that is completely read only. So if you if uh, then it would be put automatically in the read only section. Mm -hmm. uh, so if if you have for example a string. We, a string is always read only, so a string always ends up in the read only section. Right. Mm -hmm. If yeah, you have because... a more complex class, you would need to say it uh, manually, but it's like uh, because by default these things end up in the writable section. 
right? Because because I guess the readable section on operating systems, if I start, let's say, many processes of native image, it will be shared, right? Or are they yes, systems? but also the write level, uh, okay. unless unless you really do the first right. write to it. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's not too much difference. And since the image heap is never garbage collected, the, the garbage collector does not move any objects. Uh, right. But it's like if you have a lot of writable objects next to each other, but you actually never write to them, mm -hmm. then you get the same behavior as if you have the object in the read-only section. Mm -hmm. Cool. Right. But don't we also ma memory map? The, don't we also memory map the, essentially the whole image heap into a different place so that it's kind of copy and write anyhow? So I think. Uh, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. So we actually, I think you never uh, modify what's in the heap, basically, or in in the sp in in the place. You will modify it in a memory. memory right. Heap. Yeah. You might make oh. yeah. You might make a copy of it, and then it will add to the memory consumption of the of the process. But as long as you don't write to it, it won't. Right. right. Exactly. Right. Cool. Right. Right. Cool. So that was that was the, the the I think the why. I mean, of course, like this this document is very well uh, extendable. But this is what I've seen by now as uh, mm -hmm. very very useful, uh, very useful things, and 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 you uh, know in, in in many places irreplaceable. I would say. Right? Mm -hmm. So so just before we go to the to the dangers of, of build time initialization, I would like to just go through the rules a bit, mm -hmm. uh, so yes. people are aware of what are what are essentially. You know what 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 do we, what what, is, what what do we do behind the scenes just like a tiny bit, and then what are the rules that they, that are imposed by the by the Java semantics itself? Mm -hmm. uh, so so first let's talk about the types of classes in in Broadway and native. So there is essentially so there is for each class we have three three kind of levels of initialization, and and I here like or like reorder them a bit to our to our standard order. So so the first time is is the build time initialization, and this marks that this class is initialized during native image build, and all of its statics fields will be uh, that are reachable will be saved in the image heap. Okay, so that's uh, so essentially you know if you have a reachable field in this class, everything from that field will be stored into your image heap. Mm -hmm. Then we have runtime classes. It actually marks that the class is initialized in runtime, and this is our default, right? So we, if 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 you have a class in native image, by default it will be marked as runtime, um, you know, and the the class initialized are will, and as well the values of the fields will be computed at at runtime, right? Mm -hmm. And we have this third one, which is not really visible in the APIs, and and it's it's left intentionally so because it's kind of not completely sure what we want to do here. And and this is like a, called a rerun, and it's an internal state. That means uh, this is a this became a build time class by accident, which means someone was evaluating code at the build time, and then some of the classes got initialized, but we don't really want them to have them initialized at build time in the in in our final image because, for example, it's incorrect or or yeah, for example, it's incorrect, right? Mm -hmm. So so this is essentially kind of a uh, yeah, this this when you mark something as rerun, you say, I know it was by accident initialized at build time, but I want it to be runtime. So so that means that the static fields will be like computed at runtime. Recomputed. And the, right. recomputed. the static initial also will be rerun. So rerun is kind of like runtime. Yes, it's run. Yeah, so it you, is a, yeah. and it's that the reason why we don't advertise it too much, and it's also not in the APIs, is like uh, it the class initializer really runs twice, and uh, that can have strange side effects, mm -hmm. but it's one of these things. It's like uh, sometimes you really need this uh, this state because there are things you cannot do otherwise. A very good example is, for example, uh, the the random seed holder in in the mask class in the JDK, because it's like obviously you use random number generators during image at image build time, so the class gets initialized. But you cannot bake that random seed into the image because right. otherwise all your images would produce the same random numbers. But it's like you need to run this code twice. Uh, but uh, you really need to know what you're doing when using this state. Right. Because it's like it can have very unintended side effects. Like you, you allocate singletons twice and then you can mix them up and suddenly you're wondering, well, I have I thought I have a singleton, but now I have two instances of this class, and right, yeah, you don't want that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
So I think we should add this to this document, like why, what, what can go wrong in this case, but not for the, probably not for the presentation, but for later, I think we should add a few examples how this, this yes, and surprise, I think, surprises I think for, you. Yes, you might also add here like this, this note around the random seed uh, that can have some some like in general it's it's the random seed but it's, yes it's also some configuration from the operating system or or from the machine that the build uh, the the image build is running on uh, could make it via this build time initialization into the into the image heap right yes it's so, random seeds one other big class of things is like for example the number of uh, processors and yes. the, the heap size that you have right like you don't want to inherit that from the image build, but you're running code that actually does something at image build time. So it's like you need to query this data because right. uh, uh, it, it's necessary. It's like you're running a fork join pool at image build time. So you need to size that properly, but then you run another fork join pool at runtime, but you want to use a different process to count. So it's like right. you need to reinitialize the code that, uh, that gets the process to count. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Cool. So so let's look at the properties now. Let's let's start with some some properties of, of, of classes. So for the build time initialize classes, basically. So first of all, all of the classes stored in the image field, all the, the classes of ob, all objects stored in the image field must be initialized at build time. And this is necessary essentially for correctness, right? Because if you if you if you have something in your image heap and then for example you reach it through a virtual method. Um, you would all of a sudden call a function that was of, of an inconsistent object, of an object that has data, but it hasn't, the, the class initializer hasn't been executed. Right, right. I mean, this is kind of just like in Java, when you have an object instance on the heap, it is guaranteed that this that class initializer was running before that instance is created on the heap. And yes. so if this is the image heap, it, it, yeah, it, it's clear that the class has to be uh, initialized at build time if if an object of the class ends up in the image heap. Exactly. Yeah. And the, the, uh, because otherwise we would need a complex read barrier kind of thing to right. or oh, before you access this object you need to initialize a class then right. that, that would be a complete mess. So it's right. like there's there's no way to lift this restriction. Right. Makes sense. So then then we have all of the super classes and super interfaces with default methods, right? Of a built-time class must also be built-time as well, right? And that's, that's because essentially when you initialize it, a class, it starts initializing all of its super classes and interfaces with default methods, right? So interfaces without default methods are left alone. And this again comes from the Java spec, right? You cannot, yeah. you know, you, can, you cannot have a consistent state. It's guaranteed by, the, by, the, by, the, by, J by Java essentially that it all needs to be executed, right? right. Um, yeah, so, and essentially and the code reach, this kind of comes from the rules above. So any code reached through a class initializer at build time must be either marked as build time or rerun, right? And, and uh, yeah, and in, in this parson of the, the, the Jackson library that we've shown right here, essentially, uh, we, we kind of, most of the Jackson library will be reached at build time, right? So if you look at this example again, uh, here, when we do mapper the read value, right? So we want to just store this in play data, but on the way, right? We accidentally initialize like half, half of the JSON library, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll come for, to I will come back to that to show why why this causes causes issues, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So good. So let's uh, yeah. And now we talk about pooling, right? So we said it's def by default. It's uh, you know we said it's very important for performance. Uh, and by default, we do everything at runtime. But unfortunately, um, this is this is this is not uh, this is not going to yield performant code. So what we do is we, we we resort to kind of proving most of the classes that are safe, which means side effect free, and can't have unintended uh, effects. We 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 prove them as they are safe to initialize at build time. Right? And and kind of we have two types of proof, two, two types of proofs. One is during analysis, right? Which is for for simpler cases, you can essentially proving while you're first time seeing the class in analysis. And uh, um, and this is a fact has that like everything that's proven then will be basically, for example, if you have a static field which is computed at that time, yeah, and you have a conditional that static field, this conditional will be will be gone, right? So so you might even lose big parts of your image size because you computed something in build time. Right? Right. 
And then we have like the after analysis part, which is which does a bit more complicated uh, computations. And actually, there we could even expand quite a bit more. Um, uh, and then uh, after analysis, essentially, it won't affect it won't affect uh, it won't affect the, the, the analysis result. It won't affect the image size, but it will affect performance because it will remove these checks uh, in the compiled code. So all the checks from the beginning, they will be removed for classes proven here. Right? Mm -hmm. And just to kind of show what people can expect, I won't go into the details of the rules, but we have this nice test, test class initialization must be safe, and this is because of our test, right? And here we can we can exactly see by by the by the suffix of the class. Um, we, we can see whether whether essentially when is it proven, right? So for example, this is a pure class, right? We have just like assign two values to the same field. This is a safer, right? Easy to prove. Um, you know, this one is yeah. This one... So so just uh, in terms of terminology here, like when we say has safe, it means basically it's a class where I cannot observe whether it is uh, initialized at build time or runtime. And if I cannot observe this from my application code, then it's safe uh, to initialize the build time because I don't change uh, application semantics, right? Right, exactly. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Unless you uh, are worried about side channel effects and say, well, of course, there's a right. timing difference, but yes. we're not worried about that. So right, like sure. from an application behavior, there, there's no difference. So it's like right. uh, no, no one, for example, can ever uh, Unless you have all the badly multi-threaded application, mm -hmm. no one can observe in uh, uh, in this first example that we ever had the value C or that we ever had the value one, and right. people only see the value V uh, forty two. Mm -hmm. Right, makes sense. Right. So, and then let's say something that like must be delayed. Right. For example, we do uh, you know we call. We, we print right. something that's that's not going to work, right? Because this could be any other like. So basically, when you have a native call of any kind, this will mm -hmm. this will not be proven, right? And then all kinds of system properties, and then starting threads, of course, things like that will always be delayed, right? right? And we can look at some of them which are proven uh, late. Um, this is a bit below. Safe, really. So so essentially, people kind of, but it's it's really obvious. I, I would say. Uh, it, it it is pretty it is pretty easy for someone to understand if a class will be you know if a compiler can prove this right and, right. and by looking at this test essentially you can see that right? so here is something that's proven late so for example recursion this requires like intensive like a, more, a bit more intensive analysis and for that for that we will prove this late right or here this unsafe accesses uh which we have which we folded during static analysis right they will essentially again be proven late um yeah and there is one more i think with a quite a bit of uh reflection yeah for the, for, for example this one right mm -hmm. so no 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 no. let me just give a second yeah also this one is interesting so reflection must be safe early right so so even if you do some 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 kind of complex complicated looking reflective operations mm -hmm. right as long as they're kind of resolvable by the compiler in a straightforward manner so you right. pass constants in right this will all be all be kind of proven this even early right, right. So that's i mean this is in general actually in terms of reflection calls like in native image the static analysis tries to always see if you have a reflection call like here where you have a constant class name for example and then tries to like uh, see through that right and really recognize what could be called here right right exactly mm -hmm. exactly so yeah, and this is this is basically for you know if you don't want to go into specific rules how we do it and these rules also evolve, evolve in the code as we as we develop new techniques. This test is probably the best place to come and see what, right. what you can do. Right. Mm -hmm. um, cool. So so now we understand that we prove stuff at at build time and that's really cool. And now we, we should also mention a few limitations of heap snapshotting, which are very important. And that is when you store something in the heap, it's essentially it must not be uh, objects containing like information from the build system, right? So, for example, open files. That's a bad idea. You store like a, a file that was open in a in a in a in a build system. You store it into the image, and then when you run it in a in a in a on, on your users, 
machine, this, this yeah. file doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. So that's, that's bad. And then also uh, like objects containing host VM information. So for example, running threads, continuations and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, then then uh, object pointers to native memory. That's also very hard to transplant. Although I think theoretically this could be possible, but we don't do that, right? And then also what we prevent is known random seeds, right? But it's of course impossible to prove that no one wrote their own random generator, but uh, at least we, we kind of, uh, we found a way to prevent all random seeds from the from, from native image. Actually this PR took quite a, quite some time to, to, to fix, right? Right, so we will put an error and not create the image if somebody tries to do that. Yes, if someone tries, and actually this was missing, so we get to fix quite a few places where, mm -hmm. where this was a problem. So, uh, and then for runtime classes, it's basically inverse of the of the built-in classes. So, so all subclasses of a runtime class, of course, must be also a runtime class because if any of them were essentially initialized, uh, they would also initialize the runtime class. So that's not possible. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so the runtime okay. initial classes must not end up in the image heap. So this is, this is kind of pretty, pretty straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so yeah, this is, this is what basically everyone needs to know. If they want to, if you want to do your own class initialization, you need to be aware of these rules because, because if you just go you know, into it and these rules are not really obvious, right? And then you are following the error messages. So it takes a bit of time to understand what's going on, right? So it's way okay. better to kind of understand the rules. And then, and then it's easier to right. Um, yeah. yeah, but the, but the default for most users, right? If I'm not an application framework developer, right, I would still start off as just just um, not specifying anything, which defaults uh, classes to runtime initialization, uh, and let kind of the system hopefully prove for most of my classes that it's safe to initialize it at uh, build time. Uh, and I guess one one like uh, one thing here is that uh, yeah we, we we kind of recommend to not have complex static initializers because it makes it yeah. much more likely that a... and we can I think we will discuss a little bit more it's like you can also restructure your application uh, to to help it's right. like if you you can split the class into two parts and say well I have a, one of one part that is initializable at build time. So I more or less put my constants that are simple in one class and I put things like a logger or so into a separate class. Mm -hmm. And then I have uh, uh, only the things that really need to be initialized at runtime, initialized at runtime. So it's like, uh, it, it's actually probably easier and safer uh, to actually refactor your application than to manually uh, initialize a class at build time when you right. have a performance problem. Yes, I, yes. yes. Yes, we'll reach that. We have a we have a good example from that. Day that, that uh, and it's I think the most common thing that right. happens to people when they when they play with this. So we will we will basically show this how 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 you can rewrite your application on on, on simple examples, right? right? We didn't. Go yeah, and I mean I mean writing like very complex st static initializers with side effects and all that is is kind of a anti pattern in Java, I would say, because because of this also uncertainty even on a, when you run on a on a regular chit mode uh it, there's some uncertainty as to like when this code is actually going to be executed right there could be like data races between class initializers um that you that, that are hard to reproduce uh, because class initialization is is due to the multi-sided nature of the vm and and the associated rules it's kind of yeah, one one very hidden danger that most people are not aware of is actually deadlocks between class initializers. Right. And actually, I I filed a JDK bug uh, mm -hmm. recently where some uh, core JDK classes just deadlocked uh, when uh, you in, did the correct uh, did some class initialization in multiple threads. So it's like you you call two API methods of the JDK at the same time, and uh, the JDK deadlock mm -hmm. because the class initializer. Uh, dependencies had cycles and so it's right. like uh, and every class that it gets initialized uh, holds a lock mm -hmm. and you have a deadlock so right. it's like very complex class initializers have hidden dangers uh, and not doing much in a class initializer also cleans up your application right mm -hmm. yeah and and if you would if you would use like let's say a singleton pattern or something you would I mean, the, the best way to do it is like, I might have a static field with the singleton, but it's initialized with null and only the first time I access the singleton, I would, I would then construct the instance lazily, right? 
um, which which then would leave the static constructor like uh, very simple because it doesn't do anything, and it would then initialize my singleton uh, when the application is first using that singleton object, and not when the VM decides to for some reason initialize that class. Yeah. Well, one reason why people use class initializers is, of course, that uh, you have the guarantee by the specification that your class initializer only runs once and only in one thread. Mm -hmm. So if you have such singletons, one, one good pattern actually is so that you make a holder class that just contains this singleton. So you make a static final field for that singleton, mm -hmm. but you have nothing else in this class. And that way you have the best guarantee that you don't have cycles because it's like, there's nothing in this class initializer other than allocating the singleton, mm -hmm. but you still get uh, the benefits uh, of uh, yeah uh, of the automatic synchronization that the right. JDK is doing uh, and Charles right. doing. Yes, yes, yes. You get the benefit that the uh, that the static initializers are automatically uh, synchronized, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And that's actually the pattern that also works best for native image. Because it's like if you have these singletons into in a separate class, then it's like either it's a singleton that's easy to prove safe for a class initialization at build time, mm -hmm. and then the singleton will be allocated at image build time, and you have, don't have to do anything. Or if the singleton is not safe for allocation at uh, at build time, then it will automatically be alloc uh, allocated at runtime because the class is initialized at runtime. Mm -hmm. But without any uh, performance impacts on other places, because uh, there's only this one singleton in this class. So it's like it doesn't. Uh, it looks a little bit both because you make a completely new class just to define one static final field, but it's actually a, a pretty good pattern in, in Java. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. One comment on the chat is uh, that like um, singletons are quite common in in application frameworks like Spring and Micronaut. And uh, I assume that's one of the reasons why, why, like, why these frameworks are trying build time initialization to have the singletons already in the image heap, right? Yes. And it's like one thing in, in Java that's not really a singleton, but it's like enum values are a, a prime example of these objects that uh, you want to have allocated at image build time because enum values are objects. But uh, the, in the class initialization at build time, the automatic proving works for them. So it's like, and you could say about all enums that are uh, that people write, uh, these instances get allocated at build time because the enum class is easy enough to be proven safe for allocation and initialization at build time. Right. Right. But I would also argue that that like most of most of static state is usually just an anti pattern because. Sooner or later in a system, you want to make it a modular system. So if you have like a compiler, you want to make two compilers. And at that point, all of your static state that is mutable becomes a, becomes a problem. Right? Yeah, that, that's uh, that's true. And that's why also in the Gravium team, the general for the whole project, the general policy is to try to avoid any static state wherever, yeah, wherever possible. Because yeah, exactly. We, we actually kind of experience this uh, in our project as well, because Initially, we thought, okay, yeah, I mean, there should only be one instance of our JIT compiler ever, right? And then we figured out, oh, no, no, there's there's various <laughs> there's various applications uh, where we create multiple instances of Gravium compiler, and uh, then we had to do quite some restructuring on some parts to make sure uh, that we don't have too much static state. And I, cool. I, I totally agree that that having static state uh, sooner or later, once the project gets new use cases, you might want to uh, like uh, have like Two two instances of something. Exactly, and and the only the only thing why people still use so much of static static initialized st static state for that is because it's in in Java is in particular is but in many other languages it's really inconvenient to pass this object state around right you end up with these providers and providers and right. whatnot and and if if this was a bit like somehow hidden in a language so you don't have to pass them manually all the time right. uh this this can become a, a that, really that, nice is, that is that is true yeah um, like we ended up in the code with a lot of providers there's a lot of provider providers and provider managers but it's, it's but, a price it's a price to pay for a quite powerful uh, mechanism i would say Yes. yes, but also I think that that's a really good place to improve a language and find the right. find the pattern. Okay, but let's get. Uh, Shall we get back to the? Cool. Yes, there, yes. There's one question in the chat, which is that uh, could there be like this? 
could there be tools that that will automatically suggest you to split the static initializer i guess i guess like like we have a lot of information about the static initializers during static analysis could you present some of the information to the user so he can um, modify his code accordingly? Yes, I mean, we already have a little bit of tracing outputs. Uh, I guess William will, will show later, it's like that tells you which classes are initialized at build time and runtime. Mm -hmm. But yes, we could uh, give you also more information uh, why a certain class cannot be initialized at build time. It's like that for each class, at least we give you the first reason that more or less uh, why this class was not initialized automatically at build time. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's like, and uh, also uh, one one interesting thing is like, for example, we, we could tell you then, oh, you have cycles in your class initializer. It's right. Like, right. Uh, we, don't, uh, we, don't, we don't do that yet, but actually that's a very good idea. I think we should, we should not only, when we fail a proof, we should say why we fail the proof so that people can essentially fix that. Right, so, right, so right. and, and maybe, maybe we can even somehow detect data races in class initializers. So I, was, I was actually thinking about this. I mean, either, either we try to statically prove it or, or there could also be the option to, to maybe um, do some, uh, some fuzzing with uh, our Truffle Java implementation, for example, to, to figure out that class initializers, that the order of class initializers actually matters for this application, which, which is like a, um, a, a design mistake, right? Right, right, right. And also this design mistake we, we hit from time to time in bigger projects, right? So it's right. not something that... No, no, it's, it's I think it's, it's quite common. No. Once you no. are sufficiently complex in your project and have sufficient amount of class initializers, it's quite common that people are just um, not aware that there could be uh, a data race there because because they just rely on, 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 a, on the typical um, order in which uh, classes will initialize there, but it's not actually guaranteed that this order is always always the same. And, and the nasty thing about those bugs is that they will be very hard to reproduce. Yes, yes, yes. It's a, it's a Heisen bug, right? That's what we call it in, in the project, right? Right. Yeah, cool. So so let's start with the, now where, where initialization, when people misuse it, goes, goes wrong and how it can go wrong, right? And essentially, I would start from security because I think that that probably like you know there is like a bug where something fails a bit. But if you leak your security information, this can this can cost the company you know, uh, significantly, right? So so here we have a good example, right? You can, for example, have a static final private key that you you know load a private key from somewhere, or you can have your uh, your own random generators. It's not all generators are basically Java ones, right? And and if you put this in a static final field, right? This will this will uh, you know initialize at build time. This is very dangerous. Essentially, you're you're making a, a huge security call, right? Um, and we can see that, for example, if you build this program here, I don't I won't go in the interest of time. I won't do that. But we have examples uh, linked. So essentially, you will see that that you know entirely random sequence is exactly the same between two runs, and this this means like a security exploits, right? right. So so yeah very be, be very careful with that right and we should probably try to find even more things we, we forbid in the um in in java right mm -hmm. so so then we have data leakage right so now that's privacy problems right so you say system will get property dot user home you store it in your user home right and and all of a sudden like someone will have my uh, slash uh, users video van off right and my path right and that's that's not good right so again uh, first, it, it might also not be correct, which is possible, mm -hmm. but then also then also will will basically leak information about the build machine, right? And this this is just a canonical example because any kind of a file structure or any file loaded from the from the you know CI or or a build machine, you will, you will it will end up in the image and and hence leak, right? So so we that's that's a, another reason why you kind of you you really need to be picky when you're when you're doing um, when you're doing your self initialization at build time, right? And and essentially, if you want to detect this particular case, there is a flag actually detect user directories in image heap, which is written by Christian, and it's a, it's, a, it's sometimes overshoot, but very rarely, and it's I think it's a very useful it's a very useful flag for that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. and it's like that, that we have this tension. It's like ideally we would enable this check uh, all the time because it's like well, why would you ever want to embed your home directory, but 
there are use, valid use cases where you want to do it. And so it's like, we need to allow it. And uh, one thing is like that the same that holds for the user directly also holds for the temp directly. But of course we cannot uh, prevent slash temp to be embedded as a string in the image heap because uh, in most cases, the temp directory is, uh, is more or less uh, the same on Linux. Mm -hmm. It's like, we, we cannot check that automatically. It's like, there's this right. uh, tension. It's like, we cannot disallow you uh, to do you slash temp in a string. So we cannot automatically check that you never capture the temp directory in a static final field. Right. Yeah. I mean, these hints are, are like best effort, right? It's not exactly. It's so it's like, we do count. what we can, but it's right. like in the end, uh, yeah, we, we... right. It's the user's responsibility. If he if he explicitly selects build time initialization for some parts, it's in the end still the user's responsibility um, to yes, yeah. to to make sure that that uh, no state that is problematic would be cached there. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's uh, another question in chat. Like, why do we have to split the initialize in separate classes? Why can't we just split the static initializer itself of a single class to be partially executed at runtime and partially at build time. I guess we don't do this, right? We, we select always for a whole class, whether the whole static initializer is either at build time executed or at runtime executed. Yes. And that has to do, of course, again, with uh, quite integrate, uh, uh, intricate Java semantics, because it's like, while a class initializer is running, you can, of course, already initialize uh, access fields that are not initialized yet. Mm -hmm. So when you have, for example, a class initializer that sets a field uh, to one and then sets a static field to 42, but in between it does a method for that reads that field, you read the, the value one. Right. So it's like for correctness reasons, uh, uh, you cannot just uh, split the class initializer. Mm -hmm. We have one optimization. Uh, that we detect static final fields uh, that are uh, written only once. Mm -hmm. And then we have an optimization to, we cannot initialize the class at build time, but we can do sort of a constant folding of this field. Mm -hmm. But you still can do this constant folding only after doing an explicit check, oh, has this field been written already in the class initializer? Right. So you, uh, you, you cannot get your performance back completely. So you, you, uh, uh, so the bottom line is we cannot split the class initializer into two parts automatically mm -hmm. and uh, just assume that everything goes well. Right. You yeah. still need at least a little runtime check that uh, this uh, static final field has been already initialized. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think also writing this extra extra boilerplate is not so bad. I mean, this is this is usually in a separate class, so it don't, doesn't disturb you much. And and you know, if over time this becomes a very common pattern, then the, the common pattern can have a language feature which will do this for us. Right? Right. So so I would I would I would I would not be hesitant because this is not one of these like code changes which will make your projects look horrible and make make extra complexity. It will just essentially add a bit of right. boilerplate. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, one day we can have a language feature right. for that. So yeah. that's good. Yeah. yeah. And also, if some, something that many people probably don't uh, really realize it's like the order in which you define your static final fields in the class actually matters. And it, right. it can have an observable difference in your application when you reorder static final fields or static fields that get initialized at build time. Right. It's like, again, if, if your application really depends on that, you're writing very bad code. Right. But uh, right. uh, it happens, of course. Yes, it happens. It happens. People course. make mistakes. Right. And... Right. Cool. All right. So I don't have the latest, I think, here. That's very strange. Or I didn't. It's funny that on Git, it's now main. I like this. This is all written. There we go. Yes. Correctness, right? So this is a, now again this reading system properties essentially. So so what you're doing is you're essentially breaking uh, breaking the correctness of your code, right? And that's 
Um, that's a bit of a problem because essentially um, we had this example in Java, right? And this is, for example, for INET address, right? So here you all of a sudden read a property here at build time. And at the beginning, this was a build time initialized class, right? Which, because we, we thought that INET addresses would be useful and they actually show up in image heaps quite often, right? Okay. But then, then what you're doing is essentially someone comes and opens a bug and says like, I, I try an native image and I pass this uh, system property and nothing changes. I still use IPv4 by default because on your build machine, it was IPv4 by default. Right. And essentially you're, you, with all system properties, you need to be aware that if you initialize them at build time, your application won't work the same anymore, right? So when you start it up, you pass a system property, that's that's already evaluated, so never, never going to come back, right? Um, and and this kind of this kind of leads us that like simple code changes could cause unintended and unknown correctness problems, right? So if you go to this if you go to this read property holder here, right? So mm -hmm. let me uh, here in the VS Code, let me open it, right? So so I here made like a, a simple uh, a simple kind of a, so here we say you know we read a system property mm -hmm. or for example if this can be in a completely different library module within a company or whatever, right? So, so, and, and if you hear, if you do like, you know, if this was the code before, so a developer who is like in a different module, right? And this is correct code because we initialize this at build time, it's completely fine. We will not use the fast inverse square root, right? <laughs> but then, but then some developer comes and says, oh, I would like to have this configurable, but he doesn't tell a developer that they kind of initialize the build time, this class, right? Uh, it's all of a sudden, it's a breaking change. Right, you, 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 you kind of that's that's one of the things that kind of really freaked me out a bit about about class initialization is that that you can by changing by, by writing your your application in a, what you are expected to be correct, you essentially by someone else initializing your thing in a completely different like department or like part of right. the world, library breaks your code. Right. Right. Yeah. But but this this would only I mean if if you don't specify anything for the read property holder, right? we would in the original version automatically initialize the build time and in the new version our system would actually detect that it's no longer safe to initialize the build time and move the initialization to runtime right exactly. so this, this problem can only occur if there is some manual configuration that's overwriting the default behavior i think that's important here exactly yeah, good point I, I should have said this like a bit uh, stronger so all of these like problems hidden dangers are essentially all when you start like when you start with explicit uh, in explicit you all, this is like this is essentially this section tells you you're opening this can of worms right you know you you better you better take care of all of these things right in order to do it right and that's and that's what in my, in my experience from the community by now many people don't really go into the such fine details right, right. So, so, and that's that's yeah. We, we should I'll put this in a final document as, as uh, if you're if you're changing stuff, you know, right. you, you must read this basically, right? Yeah. So, so, and then again, crossing the library boundaries. This is again, uh, you know, this this happens mostly with loggers, right? So, so essentially, you know, you have somewhere in your project this happens in Netty a lot, for example. And this like you have a logger, right? And you want to log in your uh, class initializers. Right. You want to log outside of them. Right, and you say you know get the logger, right? And then of course this does like a bunch of stuff, and then it can log ls, slf for j, log back or whatnot, right? And all of a sudden, by initializing this class, you initialize you don't know what you initialize, right? And you went into a completely separate library and you initialize half of it uh, unintentionally, basically, right? So that's and that's that's uh, that's again causes a lot of a lot of like in the community a lot of. Um, a lot of confusion, right? And we'll sh sh show later how you can get rid of this pattern. So, um, and then yeah, and then one one big point, right, is like also code compatibility. So, so this is this is for me a very particular point where I realize that this this feature we, that we need to kind of really uh, uh, put 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 a big like exclamation mark and say if you do something manually do it very very carefully right and 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 you know be a, be aware of what, what it can, what can happen right and, and and the biggest problem is that you once you mark something as initialized as, as build time right it's it's a it's a strong requirement that this class is like across the whole java ecosystem can be stored in someone's image heap right so then your downstream libraries start initializing like put this putting this like uh class in the in the image heap 
and then if you if you ever have to change your decision basically you're breaking you're breaking compatibility of your library right and this was happening for us for example i think for the inet address was essentially it was allowed to be in the heap and then not allowed and then in that this was also happening a lot right and 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 so and this can also happen in two ways so you explicitly change like here in that this is a good example this is like a this is how this file this is just the last commit in this file basically right where basically uh very very essentially you know someone initialized netty uh completely right and then and then people realize that this is not functioning correctly because you're kind of like reading system properties and whatnot right and then fixes started coming in right and the fixes usually will contain a file right which which changes a lot of things and then it has to also change like let me find it here right it says okay all of a sudden all of these classes now have to be runtime initialized right and you know downstream projects could initialize the build time and put this in a heap and you're basically automatically breaking all of, all of their builds right so but by adding these four lines you're potentially breaking breaking like a, a whole ecosystem right so like four lines you know everyone who uses netty can collapse and uses build time initialization without uh you know without being careful right? okay. so this is and i think this is a very very strong strong point why you need to be super careful mm -hmm. Um, yes. Okay. So, yeah. so we're, we're slowly getting like to yeah, the was, to the end was, here. Uh, yeah. There is some more details in the document, and uh, right. I guess anybody interested can further go through the document, um, or then like also have if there's people with more questions, uh, you can reach uh, Voyen and Christian both on the right. Gravium Slack. Um, <laughs> Can we also just show a pattern on what you should do? It's sure, very sure. quickly, right? Yeah. So, so here you have other examples of stuff that goes wrong, right? But the, the, basically, the pattern you need to, you know, you need to rewrite the code so the native image can prove, uh, you know, critical classes, right? And with this invert square root decision, you essentially, you basically, you what you do is you take this like boolean fi final and you just make a private static class that co contain it, contains it and use that, right? And you're done, right? You can your 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 whole math class is initialized build time. You can have no performance problems, and and basically you still keep the same functionality, right? Our system will prove this as like, you know, runtime, right? right. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing you can do with loggers is we can use this is very important. You can use the system properties that we provided, right, to check whether basically you're at build time. So so if you're you know instead of just using a static logger, you can basically say get logger, right? And then you, you know, if you're in native image build, do use a not no op logger. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, use like a logger that you would otherwise use. And essentially, you're safe, right? If you really have to go there, like for example, for this platform dependent zero in Atti, right? This is like a class which, if you try to initialize a build time, right? This is a, you know, it does like much reflection, re reflective stuff. And you see, it just uses a logger, and that's a bigger right. problem. Right? That's why we cannot just handpick this class. Is because of that and all you need to do is like do a get logger here right. and then just that's it basically you just do a no op logger for native image Makes it's sense. uh it's basically just the property right? mm -hmm. and i think this concludes it basically you can debug it that that should be in the error message right. so really no reason to talk about this yes yes stuff. and we had a twitch session it's now uploaded to youtube about uh, about the debugging capabilities there about how you can trace it and yeah but but i think in general still like since the default is is runtime i think for for regular users, meaning people who are not developing frameworks, um, ideally they would uh, they would at least start off with uh, having no special configuration, having the classes uh, initialized at runtime, and um, and uh, and and just uh, avoid kind of really and avoid like uh, strange things in static initializers. I think that's kind of the takeaway I would say for for non-framework developers to make sure that, that this works for you, right? But then if you want to optimize the application better uh, or, yeah. And I know that some frameworks, I think Quarkus currently forces application classes to run time initialization, uh, to, to build time initialization. Um, I, think, I think that might not be the best default uh, and uh, but we need to still discuss this uh, with with the Quarkus developers. But right, in, su he, in such a he, scenario, right? In such a scenario, also just the 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 tip to not do crazy things instead of initializers should should work out for you, right? 
should work out, yes. And then you can always rewrite your code so that we can prove critical classes for your performance. Uh, we can prove them and just write them in a way we can prove them. And we can we can work with the community on like making you know patterns that we support. And and right. I think much of much of it can be done better. Yeah, and in practice, I, I talked to the Quarkus developers to say that it would be for their users. It, they haven't run into uh, big problems for application users. So really, the the challenge is for framework developers like uh, Netty developers, uh, Quarkus, Spring Native, uh, or Micronaut developers to make sure their frameworks are are appropriate. But for your user application code, it should typically uh, work uh, without um, without without this this really special expert things. Um, Yes. All right. Cool. Yes. So we'll we'll have more sessions that are really deep dive into native image with with the creators and core maintainers here, uh, uh, and uh, so we'll have more chances for you to ask uh, questions to Christian and Wojen in the upcoming weeks. I think you will probably do regularly, like um, maybe once a month or so, a, a, a native image deep dive se session. Where we really uh, give you access to the the actual maintainers. But uh, yeah, for today, we are out of time. Um, I'd like to thank you, Avoyan, for the great uh, presentation here. And also, no, Christian, for, for giving your expert inputs.